without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand over the program to our lead curator for African Brilliance, Dr. William Dewey. Thanks again for joining us and preparing. Okay, thank you, Brandy. Um, I've never done a virtual <laughs> walkthrough of an exhibit, and so I've kind of combined a number of uh, sources, some installation um, shots to give you a, a sense of what the exhibition looks like if you haven't actually um, been there, but then also um, combining it with uh, uh, photographs of uh, objects and some context uh, photographs and so on. So to kind of uh, begin, um, if you were in the, the museum and walk up the, the stairs, this is the sign that uh, you would see at the top of the, uh, the, uh, the stairs. So the, the logo, African Brilliance, Diplomat 60 Years of uh, Collecting, and then a, uh, an explanation uh, about African art and things like, uh, like that to the left. So this is kind of uh, the introduction of going into the um, exhibit. So I also want to thank a few uh, people before I um, start. And we've been working on this exhibit uh, probably for at least four, <laughs> four years. Um, and so the first uh, thanks go to the former um, director of the museum, Jan Mueller, who helped um, with funding for acquiring some of the things from Alan Davis, who I'll talk about in a minute, uh, and also Aaron Coe, who continued support for this uh, exhibition. The exhibition um, and the website, and if you look at the Palmer um, website, you'll see a link to the um, online exhibition um, catalog. And, and so I encourage uh, people to look at that because it has many more things than what I can talk about just today um, and also many of the other um, objects. But funding for uh, Organizing that came from Provost Nick Jones through what's called the Strategic uh, Initiative Seed uh, Seed Grant. So we're thankful to all of those uh, people. Also, have to mention my co-curators Janet Purdy and Mary Jo um, Arnoldi, and then the in-house uh, curator Patrick uh, McGrady all helped in putting this um, together. Um, also, to put together the website um, that you can look at later. Um, um, Carolyn Lucarelli, Catherine Adams, um, grad students, uh, Emily Hagen, Carolyn uh, Bastien, um, Jenny Glissman, um, and then uh, staff member Cody um, Goddard helped with uh, the filming, uh, both the interviews of Alan Davis uh, and the, the so-called African uh, voices. So all of those people um, I owe thanks to. And then the installation, um, museum people, Rich Hall um, and Craig Witter uh, did an incredible job putting it uh, together. Um, absolutely, the um, registrar helped in bringing the objects um, here. And obviously, Brandy Breslin has been um, helping in uh, the, not only the publicity, but also the outreach with uh, other uh, other people. One other person um, to just mention is Eliane Hill who did the interviews of the African, um, African voices. Outside of the museum and inside, in the, the little logo that was at the um, beginning, um, Sarah Ann Wharton and uh, my graduate student, uh, Janet Purdy, um, lent their design skills to putting this together. So thank you to um, them for um, doing that. All right, so if you entered into the gallery, and it's a, a little eerie that there's nobody in the gallery, um, but it gives a good view of all of the, um, the objects, what you would see um, coming right into the gallery is the first area that we kind of concentrated on, and I'll return to that. Um, most of the objects um, here, I'm gonna, gonna talk about these and these and, and some of these over, over here. Um, is uh, from the country of Liberia, where the collector and all of the objects in, uh, in this uh, exhibition were collected by Alan Davis. And so that's one of the organizing kind of themes, but then we went geo geographically 
um, and I'll continue to do that. So where we're going to start with um, is uh, Liberia. So, but uh, just a little bit about um, um, who did uh, uh, the collecting. Um, Alan Davis was uh, in the Foreign Service for 34 um, years. His, uh, he started um, his first posting in, in Africa as a diplomatic officer was in Liberia. So we're gonna be starting with that. And just to show you who, <laughs> who we're talking about, this is uh, uh, Ellen Davis um, speaking with the then US ambassador to Liberia. When he first came to Liberia, probably 1958, 50, uh, 59, he had been in Africa previously when he was active in the Navy and had spent a few few months in uh, in Morocco, um, but diplomatic uh, career he was then posted in um, seven different uh, places and traveled to many other uh, places. And so it was 1958 that he really kind of started um, collecting African art um, seriously. This uh, on the the right hand side is a photograph I took of uh, Alan um, in um, his basement of one of the, his houses in uh, Mount Vernon. That house has been uh, sold um, now. He's moved to a retirement uh, village, but he still has another another house where most of the collection still is on Orange uh, Orange Court. Um, but you can see 2016. So we've been working on this project uh, for a while. I guess for four years uh, now. So if, as you come into the, the gallery, you're met by this map uh, of Africa. And the map of Africa, we wanted to accomplish a couple of different things. One, to show you um, the distribution and range of many, many of the, the objects. We couldn't put all of uh, them in, but kind of representative uh, of where objects um, are, are from, from both North Africa and Algeria, many from uh, West Africa and Liberia, um, Central Africa and uh, East Africa also. So we put little images uh, of many, not all, uh, of the objects that are in the, the exhibition um, kind of highlighting where, where they're from. The other thing that we wanted to include in the map was the capital, whoops, let me go back, um, to the places where Alan was posted in his diplomatic um, career. So you can't see them real well here, but I'll just kind of, kind of name them. From 1958 to 60, he was posted in uh, Monrovia, um, Liberia. That was his first, first posting. Um, then he would periodically go back to Washington, D.C. to do desk service and other things and other places like um, um, Russia, he was posted for a while. His next posting in Africa was in Burkina Faso, um, Ouagadougou. Um, it was then called Upper Volta, but then um, post-independence uh, became uh, known as Burkina Faso. Uh, that, so that was 1968 to 90. 1970 to 73, he was up in uh, Algiers, Algeria. 1974 to 77, he was posted in Dakar, Senegal. 1977 to 1980, he was in um, Kinshasa, in country that was then called um, Zaire. Now um, on the map, you'll see that it's, it's called Democratic Republic of uh, the Congo. Um, 1980 to 83, he was in Guinea. Um, and then, and that was when he was named uh, the ambassador. And so he was ambassador both to Guinea and then his final posting um, in Africa, 1983 to 85, he was the ambassador to um, Uganda. Um, then he continued his uh, diplomatic uh, career, um, both in Washington, D.C. at the Africa desk and also in, um, in Europe um, until finally retiring in 1990 and settling um, back in the Washington DC um, area. So this map we put at the, the beginning to one, give you kind of an idea of the spread of, uh, of objects, but uh, also to point out where Alan was um, posted in, uh, in Africa. 
So his first posting was in um, Liberia, um, 1958, um, stayed there uh, about two and a half, uh, half years. And interesting that he was interested in African art and had visited museums in the United, uh, United States, but this was kind of the first place that he seriously started uh, collecting. And so in Liberia at that uh, point in time, um, there was a very famous uh, missionary by the name of uh, George Harley. And Alan went to visit George, uh, George Harley at his uh, mission station um, in a place called uh, Ganta. And so um, George Harley was not only a medical missionary, uh, a doctor, um, also missionary, and so had studied theology uh, and so on, but he had a little bit of anthropological training as well. And so one of his uh, more famous uh, books, he did several, um, was uh, a book that he wrote, this is George Harley, 1950, Masks as Agents of Social Control, Control pointing out how masks uh, were used, not just for, for, for performances, but also had judicial and policing kind of roles in uh, society. So Alan went out to visit um, George Harley and this uh, game board was one of the, the first objects that Alan um, acquired there uh, at the mission, uh, mission station. So on the right-hand side, you see um, children playing the, the board game, and, and this is the, the one that's in our uh, exhibit. This game that, that goes by a number of different uh, uh, titles or, or names, is probably familiar to many Americans as Mancala. Mancala is another um, name. In uh, Liberia, it goes by Macron. Uh, and uh, it uh, routinely has five or six um, holes per row. In other parts of Africa, it has double, um, double rows. But it's basically, it's uh, played throughout Africa. It's a game of skill and strategy kind of like chess, and so you have to think about your moves, you pick up the, the seeds or stones that are in the um, little holes, and then you sow them, that's the term that they use, and so you literally distribute them around the, the board, um, and where you end up, you take the, the rest of them, and they're um, yours. So the goal is to get the most, uh, most seeds. Um, in the course of kind of doing this, uh, this exhibition, um, I knew that a graduate student at Penn State, um, a woman by the name of uh, Rebecca uh, Bayak, she um, interacted with uh, African studies that I was formerly the, the director of. I knew that she was studying these kind of uh, game boards. She's from Cameroon. And so very interesting, I, I thought that, uh, her kind of research on these game boards ended up into um, a PhD dissertation about how Africans learn this games, how strategizing they use it and so on. And so it ended up as part of her um, dissertation. We interviewed a, a number of uh, people on, on campus, both students um, and faculty uh, members. Um, and. I was very glad that we were able to get uh, Rebecca Bayek to come back uh, because now she's a postdoc. She um, actually has a, uh, a posting at the public, uh, public library in um, New York um, City. And so she came back and we interviewed her a little bit and her interviewer released portions of it is both on the website and in the, um, the exhibition, if that ever <laughs> opens, you can see a little bit of, uh, of that. So we call those African voices. So because this object had a number of kind of uh, uh, points of interest, uh, I thought it'd be good to start, start with this, that this is one, um, one of the first objects that Alan collected. Um, and secondly, that uh, Rebecca, use these kind of game boards for her own PhD um, dissertation. Another object that uh, Ellen acquired from um, George Harley, um, not while he was there, but uh, George Harley 
um, retired uh, about the same time that Alan moved on to another posting. Um, George Harley uh, retired to Virginia um, when Alan was coming back to the United States for a desk, uh, desk posting, but they remained friends um, and Alan would go down and visit him in, uh, in Virginia in his uh, retirement, Harley's retirement home. And so we acquired a number of other things and I'll talk about a, um, a, few, a few of them. So this is one of Alan's uh, favorites uh, mask that was used by the Dan, um, Dan people um, for performances. And so this is an entertainment uh, mask that was meant to typify female beauty. And so this mask uh, in particular is said to be a female uh, mask. Masks like uh, this appear in a number of kind of uh, contexts. Um, one is initiation for um, young boys, um, also for celebrations in um, villages. Um, and uh, nowadays, the, it's become more kind of a symbol of the country. And so they're for government and public kind of performances um, as well. Juxtaposing that female, beautiful kind of uh, entertainment uh, mask um, are several others. And this one, uh, called uh, Kaugle, that you can see is not meant to be beautiful. Uh, and so it has a much different kind of look and it's meant to represent a chimpanzee. And so in performances, it's kind of the um, opposite of the beautiful uh, woman's uh, masquerade. And this one, the chimpanzee is kind of antisocial and disruptive runs through the, the villages, uh, knocks people down, steals their clothes, uh, and so on. And so it's supposed to be a negative uh, example. So often the, the two and others um, appear to, together. On the right-hand side is a, a photograph um, taken by a former um, curator um, who's now passed away from the Brooklyn uh, Museum, um, but he was a friend of, uh, of Alan Davis. Um, Bill Sigman. And so he took this photograph that shows a number of the uh, masquerades um, used. Um, Ellen also um, acquired uh, a number of uh, miniature um, masks of these and others from um, George Harley. So I don't have time to talk about uh, those, but they kind of function as a, a symbol that uh, you have the use and the help of these kind of uh, masks for health, other kinds of uh, things. And those, although the masks are worn by men, it's interesting that the miniature ones can be owned by women, men um, or um, women. Another of Alan's very favorite uh, masks uh, are these uh, spoons. And so this is also from the Dan, um, Dan people, and he also acquired this from George Harley once uh, he had um, retired into uh, Virginia. Um, and Alan always says this is his favorite um, object uh, in his whole, whole collection. So what it represents is a, a spoon that's owned and used by a woman in the village that's known as the most hospitable um, and generous woman in the, the village. So you have to work at this for a while before you're kind of awarded that um, honor, and you get a, a special kind of spoon with a, a figure, female figure that's meant to represent a spirit helping, um, helping you, um, and so you use that. So because many people come to see the performances uh, in a village, there are musicians that have to be entertained, these women um, actually take care of uh, the people. And so that's her honor. And then they perform by dancing with these, uh, these spoons to distribute um, not only food, um, but also kind of uh, money, candy, and other things. So it's used in a display kind of uh, performance. Um, Alan uh, Davis's own uh, mother, um, took care of her own uh, family when he was young and grew up in Tennessee. His father died at a young age and his mother kind of took over the, um, the family. So when this uh, uh, spoon was um, 
given slash sold to the North Carolina Museum uh, of Art, um, he stipulated that it was in honor of his own mother. Um, and so this is a picture of his own mother, um, Mild Mildred Grace um, Lee, and then married um, Davis. Um, because like the generous woman in the, in the Dan village, um, his mother kind of took care of uh, um, everybody. Next, I'm going to kind of move to the next place where Alan um, was uh, posted uh, in uh, uh, 1968 to 70 um, in what was then called uh, um, Upper Volta, but then later uh, was renamed to be called uh, Burkina Faso. And so there was kind of the first time that he started uh, interacting with uh, local um, local museums. And the director of the museum there, there um, Tumani Triande, um, helped him um, kind of seeing which are good, which is bad, bad things. And he also, very carefully, he would show things that he acquired to make sure that the museum there didn't have or need some of the things that he acquired. So this was Alan's kind of pattern throughout his co collecting that he always interacted with the, the local uh, museums making sure that they didn't need um, things uh, from, uh, from there. So the objects that I'm gonna talk about are these that are on the, um, the wall. Um, and we kind of picked this side of the, the gallery so that the tall masks would fit, uh, fit in. So I'm gonna talk briefly about several of these, uh, these masks um, uh here i think uh yeah uh one over here and then these three um here so the first one is from the mosi uh people um in now burkina uh, faso and it's very interesting that their history local history um in burkina faso uh was such that the Mosi people invaded uh, and became the, the rulers of especially the northern uh, part of Burkina, Burkina Faso. But those that they conquered um, did not get up, give up their art making skills. And you see amongst the Mosi people, you see a number of styles of masks, particularly that relate to the people that were there before. And so this is one of those, uh, those people, also, so although they all speak Mosi, this is the people that were living in the area before. And so this is from an area called the Yatenga um, area. And so they make these masks to um, perform, especially at uh, funerals. And so in Africa, the, the pattern is that when a person dies, you have to be buried um, rather quickly, but the funeral proper only happens several months, sometimes even years um, later. And so at the burial, the mask will appear, but not perform. At the funeral proper, uh, the mask will, uh, will perform. And so the masks honor both men and women, um, and it's to ensure that the spirit of the deceased go on to the realm of the, the ancestors. So all of these tall masks have a tall plank portion with a face part uh, down, down there. The tall plank part, they say, they call it Yabasore, the path of the ancestors. And so what that literally means is to ensure that the deceased go to the realm of the ancestors the masks have to uh, perform various kind of um, functions. The next uh, mask also from uh, Burkina Faso is from a neighboring people. So not the Mosi people, but the Nuna, uh, Nuna people. Um, they were kind of the originators of a number of kinds of uh, masks. And on the right hand side, you can see at a performance, uh, that there are buffalo, birds, these antelopes, etc. So they have a number of kinds of uh, masks that uh, many of their neighbors kind of acquired and use them as, uh, as well. But the Nuna or the subgroup, the Nunama uh, people um, are quite famous for their kind of performances. And so this one depicting um, 
an, uh, an antelope um, is called a koala. Uh, and so here it is in our um, uh, exhibition that uh, in that photograph that I had of Alan in his house, that one was in the, the background. And so we acquired that quite a, early on. And then here um, is one from my former colleague at Iowa, um, Chris Roy, who did a lot of work in uh, Burkina Faso um, actually being, um, being performed. So the masqueraders um, hold sticks, have this raffia kind of costume that cover them. They use the sticks to kind of imitate what antelopes would, like, uh, would dance around like, so they tap them on the, uh, on the ground. These masks have a slightly different uh, function. So they entertain people at uh, uh, markets, and so periodic markets, they come and um, entertain people. They also perform in initiations of uh, young people joining um, society, so moving from the role of being kids to being um, adults. Um, but also, most importantly, they perform um, at uh, funerals. And so funerals is kind of a common theme in Burkina Faso that many masks um, do, um, do that. So these importantly um, do that. Um, across the border into um, Mali among the, uh, the Dogon people, and Alan did visit up into to Mali, um, their masks also um, are used for um, funerals. And so this is one of the, the most iconic uh, masks of the, the Dogon um, people. And when young boys join the mask uh, society, um, many of them um, are supposed to either make their own mask or have somebody help them. Many of them pick the Kanaga mask to um, have made to show that they're part of the mask uh, society. Masks appear at a number of functions, but probably most importantly, their version of funerals that are called Dhamma. And so like um, in Burkina Faso, the, the funerals happen often very uh, much later than when a person um, dies. And so the Dhamma is to honor the, um, the dead, to put on a good display, and so many uh, masks uh, come and uh, perform. Also, um, to help the spirit of the, the dead to move on to where they are supposed to be uh, living in the realm of the, uh, of the spirits. And so a whole lot of masks appear at these um, ceremonies, Dhamma, that sometimes it's just for one person, sometimes it's for a number of people that have died over the uh, previous year or, um, or two. This particular mask also has symbolism uh, in the crosshatch um, superstructure um, above it. And so uninitiated people are told that either that it's a lizard or, or a bird. If you're initiated, you know kind of the secret that it represents God. And so God creating um, earth and so from the skies above, the arms of God coming down to the earth, to the um, earthly realm and uh, earth below, and bringing it down um, down here. The masks perform in a very um, athletic kind of kind of gesture, swing their masks around, touch the the earth, and according to to some, this gesture of touching the the earth is the hand of God creating um, the Dogon um, Dogon world. Next door to, to Mali is the Bamana uh, uh, people. So all of this kind of in the same um, area. Here, masks are used for a different uh, purpose and they're primarily kind of associated with age grades. And so this is the second age grade. There's one for little kids. This one is for young people. And so men primarily, but also the girls join in and provide the, the chorus. So this mas masquerade represents their story of how agriculture came to the people. And they say that Chiwara, which is the name of the, the society, the name of the mask, and this mythic um, antelope that taught people how to um, cultivate, taught people um, and then to honor um, him 
young people perform this uh, ceremony um, during um, harvest uh, and other kind of uh, portions because young people are the ones that do most of the, um, the agriculture. So it always includes two, a male and a female, uh, uh, Chihuahua antelope. Um, this one is a male, male one um, that's in Alan's uh, collection, probably from the Eastern um, side. If you're the champion cultivator, you get the honor of wearing the, um, the masquerades. Then one last um, thing from Burkina Faso um, are these small little figures called bateba that are used by the Lobi, uh, Lobi people. And so previously they were thought to represent ancestors, but we now know, no, they don't add, uh, represent ancestors. They rather are spirits to help people with their problems and protect them. And so the figures are put in a shrine, like the central uh, photograph uh, here from Pete, Pete Meyer, um, set up for this very purpose. And so whatever your problems are, what you need to help with, these figures, these spirits, um, are there to help you. Most African art, unfortunately, we don't know the name of the carver. We were very lucky to interact with uh, the now curator at the University of Iowa, Corey Goodlock, who had done his dissertation work in Burkina Faso amongst the Lobi, and he said, well, you know, actually, I know who the carver um, is. And this photograph is of the carver that made these uh, Lobi, um, Lobi Batiba uh, figure. And so this is his name, Sid uh, Pulforte, um, was the carver that made many, um, and it has a very distinctive kind of uh, style with this kind of W-shaped uh, breast um, and pectoral muscle form, um, squared off shoulders, and these, uh, uh, kind of flipper-like uh, hands are distinctive of, of him. So we're very lucky to find um, who the carver um, was. I'm going to move now to Central, I mean to West Africa, which is kind of a catch-all um, of various, uh, various things. Uh, uh, because Alan didn't actually live in these, but he acquired over the years uh, uh, things from this, uh, this area. So I'll talk about a few of these uh, uh, Sierra Leone and Cote d'Ivoire things and a couple of uh, Nigerian um, things. So the first one is a, a figure called an Akuaba from uh, Ghana. And these um, are, have become almost like the signature of Ghana, the people associated with Ghana, although strictly it's only made for the Ashanti, uh, Ashanti people. Some neighboring people have some that are slightly different. And so it's supposed to represent, um, abstracted obviously, the epitome of uh, female um, beauty with a torso, um, breasts, belly button, and then a round um, flattened uh, head with uh, neck, uh, neck rings. These are made for women that uh, want to have children. And so it's primarily a fertility kind of uh, device. They're often called dolls, but unlike in Western society, they don't really go to kids. Occasionally they, um, they do, but they're more by use of the woman that wants to become um, pregnant. If she's successful, she sometimes then will give them back to um, the diviner or the shrine that helped them. And so this particular river shrine is famous for fertility kind of issues. And she probably, a, a woman that has one of these, probably visited this place um, or one like it um, and then gave back to the diviner that uh, helped her. And so after the use by the woman, they're kind of an advertising um, device that people could say, oh yes, they're very good at doing this. I'll go and see them and I can get one of uh, my own. This object um, uh, called the Anomaly um, from Sierra Leone is probably the oldest object that we have uh, in the, um, the, the collection and in the uh, exhibition. So probably dates from mid 16th um, century of the current era or even um, earlier. 
Um, nowadays, the people that find them in fields and so on use them for fertility and put them in rice, uh, rice fields. Um, but there, that's not the, the original kind of, uh, kind of purpose. The people that made them, we know probably were an, um, honoring chiefs and other people of high, high status. The style that they carved in, we also know that those people um, known as the, the Sapi, they also made things for export out of ivory. And these on the right that are salt sellers left Africa to the royal courts in um, Europe, um, Portugal, Denmark, Italy, etc. And we know that the same people made them because the style of the faces and the heads is exactly like these that are carved out of uh, soapstone. Um, and so very interesting that uh, we could tell who made them even though those people are no longer living there and probably moved on. What we think uh, they used them for was to honor their ancestors and remaining people now 600 years later. There is an area to the west among the Temne uh, people that still use stones to honor the, the ancestors. They take their stones from where they're buried in the western side of the village, take them to the shrine on the eastern um, side and erect what's called an Amboru Masar. And so this kind of uh, reincarnation is reenacted with these uh, stones. And so on the east where the sun rises, the stones are put, where the sun sets, where people die is on the other, other side. So perhaps these figurative ones also were used in that kind of, uh, kind of way. Um, another um, figure uh, that Alan collected are these very interesting things called spirits, uh, spirit spouts from the um, Bowie people of uh, Cote, uh, Cote d'Ivoire. And so these uh, function um, that uh, the Bowie people believe that um, before you were born, you had a spouse um, in the spirit world. Then when you get born, you marry your own spouse, and sometimes you have problems, either marital kind of affairs or other things, go to a diviner and he'll say, well, the problem is that your spirit spouse is jealous. And so the solution is to carve uh, a figure um, like your spirit spouse. So males have them made carved of female, females have them carved of uh, males, and you need to spend one night a week so that the spirit spouse um, isn't jealous and that will solve uh, your problem. So a very interesting kind of, kind of use. They also are, are very kind of modern. And so if you look on the website, you'll see that some now have um, coats and ties, uh, elaborate uh, dresses, uh, and so on. So continue to be, uh, to be used. One mask that uh, is unusual because it uh, is used by women, whereas most are used and controlled by men, is this one from the Sande um, Society, people of the Mende, um, that's a women's uh, society. And so here the women um, wear the, the mask and it goes over your, your head and so it rests on your shoulder. And this again is supposed to represent female uh, female beauty. And so here is one um, performing. So the masquerade um, takes the girls to their initiation camp. It trains them, um, gives reports back to the village, collects food for the girls. But most importantly, and that's what this photograph is showing, the graduation. So everybody's happy. The girl can now leave girlhood, become a woman, can get married and so on. So everybody's happy. And there's this public kind of demonstration. And so the masks appear um, at, the, at that. One other that I'll just kind of briefly say for Visago's Island, another form of initiation, uh, primarily for boys, uses this bull mask. And so there are wild bulls and other kinds of bulls. This one represents a domesticated bull, but one that's not quite trained. And so it has a ring in its nose and it's equated to the boys that are uh, being initiated because they're not quite ready to be adults. And so the bull 
uh, the wild bull is pulled around by the ring in its nose, and likewise the the boys are not quite uh, ready um, to be considered um, adults. Um, another one, um, I want to talk for about five more minutes, so I'm going to kind of rush through the, the rest of them. But this one is kind of uh, fun because it's from the Uterba people and it represents um, twins. And so the Uterba people believe the twins are very lucky um, and share a soul. If one twin um, dies, the other living twin would like to join it. Parents don't want that to happen. So they'll go and have either one, or both twins have died, two of these uh, figures um, carved, and then they take care of the, the figures just like they would a living um, child. Sing to it, feed it, wash it, hence why the features are kind of rubbed away by the um, love of the, uh, of the woman. And so, Here's um, a living twin with her dead, uh, dead partner. And then on the right-hand um, side, a photograph uh, done by my colleague, uh, Marilyn Hulberg in 1970, when it was kind of hard to find carvers to make Ibeji. And so she has one living um, twin and then substituted a pla uh, plastic Bobby, uh, baby doll for the other um, Ibeji. We're lucky to have in the exhibit a number of things from the Cuba, uh, Cuba people. When Alan, uh, in the late 70s, moved to Kinshasa, he interacted with the, the director um, there, uh, Father Joseph Cornet. And Cornet also, like uh, the other uh, curators, would help him, give him advice, uh, and so on. And so he acquired a number of things through the help of uh, Joseph uh, Cornet. And so in um, um, Congo, now Democratic uh, Republic of the Congo, the Cuba are perhaps best known, and Alan has um, numerous um, objects from the Cuba. And so a number of textiles, um, other, other things, uh, and some masks. So I'll, I'll just kind of briefly show those. These are well known um, because the Cuba are excellent at their graphic kind of design um, and uh, the textiles that they, they make are world uh, renowned. But the designs, these graphic designs, are seen on everything from their houses to their Camwood uh, containers to everything. And so here's a, a king, uh, a nim, in front of, the front of his house with design. And then here's a textile that we have and is kind of wrapped around a mannequin as if somebody would uh, be wearing, um, wearing it. Here's another one that we borrowed from the Smithsonian. This one could only be um, worn by royals, and so the wives of the, the king. You had to either make it yourself or acquire it through inheritance. You couldn't buy it from, um, from everybody. And so here they're, uh, they're performing. What's kind of very interesting about these uh, textiles is that it's a joint endeavor between men and women. So men do the weaving um, uh, of the, the cloth from the, uh, uh, the, 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 the hemp, well, the, the textiles, the raffia, raffia fiber to make uh, these kind of textiles, and then women do the embroidery and uh, what is called a cut pile, and so putting through kind of like making a rug and then cutting it, and so they do a number of kind of uh, motifs, and so it's a joint effort um, to make that. Also, the king wears these kind of uh, textiles and special kind of uh, hats, so this is one known as the house of the king, and so it's only worn at special occasions and when they're buried. And so here's uh, a king wearing one of these kind of, kind of hats at one of these special um, occasions. Other things from Central Africa, we have a few other royal kind of, or leaders um, hats, and I'll just kind of show you these quickly. And so this is one that Frere Cornet helped Ellen to uh, acquire and clean, because it was just covered with mud, um, for leaders on the western side, the Pende, Pende people, and they're their 
wearing them. From the northern area, the Ikonda people, and so they wear one of these kind of pagoda um, hats, um, and this is a brass kind of symbol um, showing their, their wealth. The other things in their hand are symbols of their power. Um, and then another is a funerary mask from this area. And so this is another chimpanzee mask with this kind of grin, but amongst the Hemba people, they think it's terrifying. They don't think it's funny. And so the so members, the healing society, wear this at funerals and at first are scaring people, but then they get calmed down and dance and people are performed. So again, it's kind of transition for the spirit to go to the spirit, um, spirit world. And then lastly, and I'll just kind of show you these quickly, East Africa, we have some masquerades from the Makonde um, people in Mozambique. And it also is for initiation. And so it shows adults. One of the forms of initiation is to get tattooing. It shows that you're an adult. And so on the mask, they do it in wax. Here's a real woman with these kind of uh, tattoo scarifications. And they perform at the uh, initiation, but also they now uh, perform at uh, political kind of uh, events. And so here's one uh, representing a hero of Mozambique, former um, uh, president Samora Michel. So the function has kind of changed over, over time. From Tanzania, um, they also have initiations, but there they use these small little figures called monahiti. And so girls are given these by their aunts. As they go through initiation, they also learn how to take care of children and so on. And so that's the function of, uh, of those. And then the last objects uh, and then, I'll, then I'll quit are these, uh, these headrests. Um, 1995 um, was the first time that I came to Penn State and it was to accompany, I wasn't working here <laughs> then, to an exhibition that uh, I did called Sleeping Beauties. And so I gave a lecture not knowing that, um, you know, uh, 15 years later I would come and actually work, uh, work here. So these headrests have a special kind of meaning um, to me because I did a whole exhibit about these. These are from um, Ethiopia and so they're kind of very utilitarian so they use them to keep your hairdo up off of the, the ground um, but uh, they are given as wedding presents and so one goes to females, one goes to, to males and amongst the, the Garagi it's very interesting that they don't make them that an artisan class called a Fuga make them as well as combs and other things um, for the Guragi. And then in the southern part of the, uh, the, uh, the country, Ethiopia, they're used by herders. And so the herders, uh, primarily herding um, cattle, use them in a different way. And so they sleep on them, but it's also it's to show their status. And so if you have one of these uh, headrests, it means that you're a warrior. And so it uh, declares um, who, who you are. So that's my last um, slide.